The ship took a sheer to port just as the channel narrowed and even with the helm hard to starboard, the bow refused to swing back. The pilot quietly ordered more revolutions, but the bank effect was holding the stern fast against the mud, and we could see the vegetation on the shore getting closer while the rudder angle indicator stayed pinned over without effect. We were transiting the Piranha River, outbound with a full cargo of soybeans. The vessel was a standard Panamax bulk carrier, 225 meters long. We were loaded to a draft of 10 meters even. In this part of the river, the charted depth was only about 12 meters, but the silt moves constantly, so the underkeel clearance was likely less than 2 meters. When a large ship moves through shallow water, the physics change. The hull pushes water ahead, and the water flows back along the sides at high speed to fill the void behind the stern. This lowers the pressure along the hull. It makes the ship sink deeper into the water, what we call squat, and makes the steering sluggish. The weather was clear. It was mid-morning with good visibility and a light breeze from the north that did not affect our handling. The current was following us, pushing us downriver at about two knots. This adds to the difficulty because the water moving with the ship reduces the effectiveness of the rudder. On the bridge, the team consisted of myself, the river pilot, the third officer acting as the officer of the watch, and an able seaman on the wheel. The atmosphere was quiet. We had been navigating these bends for four hours already. The pilot was experienced, a local man who knew the shifts in the channel well. He stood by the center window watching the jack staff against the tree line. This happened in 1998 on a routine commercial voyage. Before I tell you what happened next, please consider subscribing. It helps this channel reach more sailors. We were approaching a section called the Paso de Abajo. The channel here is not straight, it curves gently to the right, but the navigable water is narrow because of a shoal on the starboard side and a steep mud bank on the port side. To make the turn, we had to keep close to the port bank to avoid the shoal, but not so close that the bank suction would grab us. It is always a compromise. The trouble began subtly. We were making about eight knots over the ground. As we entered the curve, the pilot ordered starboard 10 to begin the turn. The helmsman repeated the order and turned the wheel. Usually, you expect the ship's head to start moving within 10 or 15 seconds. I was watching the rate of turn indicator. It flickered but remained at zero. The bow was not coming to starboard. Instead, the momentum of the ship carried us in a straight line, which meant we were actually getting closer to the port bank on our left side. Starboard 20, the pilot said. His voice was flat. He did not look at me yet. Starboard 20, sir, the helmsman replied. The rudder moved, but the gyro heading remained steady. We were now experiencing bank suction. Because we were close to the bank on the port side, the water was squeezed between our hull and the mud. This water accelerated, creating a low pressure zone that sucked the stern toward the bank. When the stern is pulled to port, the bow pivots to starboard. However, in this case, the cushion of water between the bow and the bank was pushing the bow away towards the center of the channel while the suction held the stern. We needed to turn starboard to follow the river, but the hydraulic forces were locking us on a straight course. I walked to the radar. The variable range marker showed we were less than half a cable from the bank line. At this speed, that distance would close in less than a minute if we did not alter course. The vibration of the engine was steady at slow ahead. Hard starboard, the pilot said. Hard starboard, the helmsman confirmed. He spun the wheel all the way over. The rudder was now acting as a brake on the starboard side, but without enough water flow over it, it couldn't overcome the suction on the hull. The ship continued to slide parallel to the bank. We were not turning. The situation escalated when I looked out the starboard window. Downriver, coming around the next bend, I saw the mast of another vessel. It was a container feeder. Inbound, we were supposed to pass port to port. However, because our bow wasn't turning, we were sliding sideways toward the center of the channel directly into the path of the approaching ship. We were taking up too much water. The pilot picked up his binoculars. He looked at the bank, then at the approaching traffic. We had two problems. First, if we didn't turn, we would run aground on the port bank or get our stern stuck in the mud. Second, if the bow suddenly broke free from the forces, it might swing too violently to starboard and cross right in front of the container ship. Captain, the pilot said, turning to me, she is heavy. The stern is smelling the bottom. 
We need more rudder effect, I said. It was a statement of fact, not a question. Yes, he agreed, but if we increase speed, the squat will increase. We might touch bottom. This was the specific danger. Increasing the RPM would send a wash of water over the rudder, giving us steering control. But increasing speed would also make the ship sink lower due to the squat effect. If we sank just 30 centimeters more, we could strike the riverbed. The distance to the approaching ship was closing. The radio remained silent. The other ship probably assumed we were in control and would complete our turn shortly. They held their line on the starboard side of the channel, expecting us to stay on ours. Half ahead, the pilot ordered. I moved the telegraph handle. The bell rang in the bridge. Down in the engine room, the engineers would be reacting to the sudden command. The needle on the RPM gauge climbed. Slowly. Watch the stern, I told the third officer. I wanted to know if we were kicking up mud. The engine load increased. We felt the vibration change in the deck plates. The propeller was now churning water harder against the rudder. For a few seconds, nothing happened. The ship felt dead. A massive steel block sliding through mud and water. The trees on the port side were distinct now. I could see individual branches. We were too close. Then the gyro clicked. One degree starboard, then two. The wash from the propeller was finally fighting the suction. The bow began to swing to starboard, answering the helm. But now we had too much speed. The ship accelerated, and as the bow swung, it didn't stop. The stern broke free from the suction with a lurch. The rate of turn increased rapidly. We were now swinging fast towards the center of the channel, where the container ship was less than a mile away and closing. The pilot ordered midships, and then port 20 to check the swing. But a loaded bulk carrier does not stop swinging easily. We were moving diagonally across the river, showing our broadside to the oncoming traffic. The ship was now reacting to the burst of engine power, but the momentum was carrying the bow too far to starboard. We had broken the suction of the port bank, but the sudden release of that force acted like a slingshot. The rate of turn indicator showed us swinging 20 degrees per minute to the right. This is too fast in a narrow channel. We were no longer parallel to the river banks. We were crossing the river diagonally, heading toward the starboard side where the water was also shallow and directly into the lane of the oncoming container ship. The pilot immediately ordered the helm hard over the other way to stop the swing. Hard port, he said. The helmsman spun the wheel aggressively. We watched the rudder angle indicator travel from starboard 20 all the way to port 35. Usually when you put the rudder hard over, you feel the ship heel slightly and the swing slows down. But in shallow water, the response is dampened. The water cannot flow easily under the keel to the other side of the rudder. It creates a backlog of pressure. The ship feels stiff. The rate of turn did not drop immediately. The gyro compass kept clicking upward, 095, 096, 097. We were pointing almost directly at the oncoming traffic. The radio cracked open. It was the captain of the feeder vessel. Southbound vessel, you are coming over very wide, the voice said. It was calm, but the concern was evident. He didn't wait for a reply. We could see his bow altering hard to his starboard, moving as close to the brush on his side of the river as he dared. He was trying to give us room, but there was very little room to give. The distance between the two bows was now less than four cables and closing at a combined speed of roughly 18 knots. That gave us just over one minute before we passed each other. Our bow was still swinging to starboard, though the rate was finally slowing down as the hard port rudder took effect. The problem was our position. We were occupying the center of the channel. If we continued on this heading, our port bow would strike his port side, or our stern would swing out and clip him as we passed. The pilot looked at the RPM gauge. We were still on half a head. The speed was helping the rudder work, but it was also closing the distance to the other ship too fast. If we slowed down now, we would lose the rudder force and the ship would continue its swing to starboard uncontrollably. If we kept the speed, we risked a high-speed interaction with the other vessel. Keep her hard port, the pilot said. He stepped out to the wing to see the clearance. The captain, stand by the telegraph. I placed my hand on the lever. The vibration of the ship was heavy. You could feel the strain on the hulls that fought the turning momentum. Finally, the swing stopped. The rate of turn indicator settled at zero, but we were not straightened out. 
We were angled across the channel. The oncoming ship was now just two cables away, dead ahead of our port bow. We had to turn back to port to get parallel, but if we turned too hard to port now, our stern would kick out to starboard, right into the path of the other ship as it passed our aft section. The pilot had to make a choice, slow down to minimize the impact force if we hit, or maintain power to keep steering control and try to squeeze through. What would you have done in a moment like this? Slow ahead, the pilot ordered. I pulled the telegraph back. The engine revs dropped. The noise on the bridge decreased. The pilot was betting that we had enough momentum to steer without the engine pushing us into a dangerous speed. It was a calculation of inertia. Midships, the pilot called, steady as she goes. Midships, dates, the helmsman replied. We were almost beam to beam with the container ship. It was a smaller vessel, perhaps 140 meters, but loaded high with boxes. As the bows passed each other, the hydrodynamics of the narrow channel took over. This is the most critical part of meeting in a narrow cut. The water pressure between the two bows builds up, pushing them apart. We felt the bow of our ship get pushed to starboard by the invisible cushion of water between us and the feeder. The pilot anticipated this. Port 10, he said quietly. He was applying a small amount of rudder to fight the pressure pushing us away, trying to keep our sides parallel. We passed close. From the bridge wing, I looked down. The gap of open water between our hull and the container ship was perhaps 15 meters. In the open ocean, that is nothing. In a river, it feels like enough, provided nothing goes wrong. I could see the faces of the crew on the bridge wing of the other ship. They were looking up at us, motionless. As our midship sections passed, the pressure changed. The water that was squeezed between the bows now rushed. To fill the low pressure zones at the sterns, this creates suction. The suction tries to pull the two sterns together. If they touch, the propellers can foul each other or the steering gear can be damaged. Starboard 20, the pilot ordered. This seems wrong to a layman, turning the wheel towards the other ship. But the pilot was countering the suction. The suction was pulling our stern to port towards the other ship, which means the bow tries to swing to starboard. To keep the ship straight, he had to apply starboard rudder to stop the bow from swinging. It is a balancing act. You are steering against invisible forces of water pressure, not just the compass heading. The stern of the feeder vessel slid past our stern. I watched the water between us. It churned white and angry, level with the main deck of the smaller ship. The wake from our propeller and his propeller mixed in a chaotic turbulence. We felt a heavy shudder run through the ship, a lateral vibration that rattled the coffee cups on the chart table. That was the suction breaking as the ships cleared each other. Midships, the pilot said, dead slow ahead. The container ship was now astern of us while rocking heavily in our wash. We were clear of the traffic, but the incident was not over. The violent maneuvers had left us on the wrong side of the channel again, and our speed had dropped significantly. We were drifting toward the starboard bank, the shoal water. The ship was sluggish, heavy, and barely moving through the water. The rudder had almost no effect at this speed. She is not answering, the helmsman said. The bow was beginning to drift toward the shallow water on the starboard side. We had avoided the collision, but we had lost our flow. The current was catching our stern and pushing it around. We were at risk of running aground just moments after clearing the danger. The bow continued to fall off toward the starboard bank. The rate of turn was slow, but at our low speed, the rudder had become useless. We were essentially a dead ship drifting in a current, and the muddy shoal was less than a ship's length away. Stand by starboard anchor, the pilot said into the UHF radio. His voice remained even. Standing by, the chief officer replied immediately from the forecastle. He had been waiting for this. In river transit, the anchor party is always ready for immediate deployment. Let go, one shackle in the water. Hold on the brake, the pilot ordered. I watched the CCTV monitor showing the forecastle. A cloud of rust dust flew up as the chief officer opened the windless brake. The heavy chain rattled through the hawse pipe, a distinct mechanical roar that we could feel through the deck even inside the bridge. After a few seconds, the chief officer tightened the brake. Anchors holding, looking up and down, the chief reported. We were not trying to stop the ship completely. We were using the anchor to dredge. By dragging the anchor along the bottom, we created a... 
pivot point at the bow. The resistance of the anchor pulling back on the bow combined with the current pushing against the hull creates a correcting force. The bow is snubbed and the current naturally pushes the stern back toward the center of the channel. The ship shuddered as the flukes dug into the riverbed. It was a low grinding vibration. On the rudder angle indicator the needle was still hard to port, but now with the anchor acting as a pivot the ship began to respond. The bow stopped drifting toward the shoal. It held its position while the stern began to swing slowly back into deeper water. Dead slow ahead, the pilot ordered. We needed just enough propeller wash to make the rudder effective again, but not enough speed to override the drag of the anchor. It is a delicate balance. If you pull too hard, you might part the chain or drag the anchor too fast. If you pull too little, the current takes over. For five minutes, we moved at a crawl. The echo sounder read three meters under the keel, safe but minimal. The GPS speed showed two knots. We were effectively tethered to the river bottom, limping back to the center line of the channel. Once the vessel was parallel with the channel markers again, the danger was effectively over. The water depth increased to 14 meters. We had regained our position in the navigable water. Heave up starboard anchor, Rusignal, the pilot said. Heave up, the chief acknowledged. The windless motor whined as it took the strain. The ship moved slowly forward under engine power to take the tension off the chain, allowing the windlass to lift the weight. The chief officer reported the status of the chain as it came in. Long stay, then up and down, and finally anchor away. When the anchor broke the surface, it was covered in thick gray river mud. The chief ordered the bosun to wash it down with the fire hose before securing it in the hawse pipe. With the anchor secured, we increased speed gradually. Slow ahead, then half ahead. The steering gear motors hummed. I ordered the helmsman to switch steering pumps, a standard precaution to ensure the motor we had been using hadn't overheated during the rapid maneuvering earlier. We also checked the rudder limiters. The erratic hydraulic pressures during the bank suction incident can sometimes trigger alarms or cause minor leaks, but the system appeared tight. We were not out of the river yet, but the narrowest section was behind us. The pilot called for a tug assist. Although we were under control, the Port Authority regulations and good seamanship suggested that after a loss of heading control, an escort tug should accompany the vessel through the remaining bends. Thirty minutes later, a harbor tug met us. It made fast a line on our center lead aft, acting as an active rudder. If we lost steerage again, the tug could pull the stern laterally to steer the ship. We did not need it, but having it there lowered the tension on the bridge. I sent the south third officer to check the sounding pipes for the forward ballast tanks and the collision bulkhead. We needed to confirm that we hadn't touched the bottom during the drift. He reported back 20 minutes later, all bilges dry, no change in sounding levels. We had not grounded. We arrived at the Ricolata anchorage six hours later without further incident. The pilot disembarked, signing the master's ticket with a brief note about the traffic interaction, but no formal protest was lodged by either vessel. In the maritime industry, near misses often remain between the sailors involved, provided no metal was bent and no paint was scratched. The cause of the incident was a combination of bank effect and traffic management. We had entered the bend too fast for the water depth, which increased the suction. When we broke the suction, the presence of the inbound feeder vessel forced us to kill our speed to avoid collision. Losing that speed meant losing our steering authority at the critical moment when the current was strongest. It was a failure of anticipation. We should have waited above the bend for the other ship to pass before entering the narrow cut. By trying to pass in the Paso de Abajo, we left ourselves with no margin for error. After we anchored, we held a short debrief in the ship's office. I instructed the deck officers to update the passage plan for this river. We added a notation to the chart. No passing in this sector. Minimum under keel clearance awareness. We also inspected the windless brake linings as they had taken a heavy load during the dredging maneuver. They were glazed but functional. We replaced them at the next dry dock. It was not a famous shipwreck. It was not a disaster that made the news. It was simply a Tuesday on the river where the physics of water displacement almost caught us out. That is the reality of sailing. 99% of the time it is routine, and the other 1% is spent correcting small errors before they become big ones. If you faced something similar with bank suction or passing in narrow channels, I'd like to hear your experience.